Hi everyone, it's Judy. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. Today's guest is someone, a familiar face to the podcast, and he did a talk recently up at Orange County IPC Designers Council meeting where he talked about via reliability. And I know that a lot of you that are doing stacked vias or any kind of HCI are probably running into this problem. So I brought Jerry in to school you up about via reliability. So without further ado, we'll jump right in. Enjoy. Welcome to All Teams On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Collaboration is critical to success. With us working remotely, it's more important than ever to convey design intent, review and comment, and iterate on mechanical, electrical and software design features to get the perfect balance of user experience and form, all while improving manufacturing performance and yields. Working from anywhere and connecting with anyone has to be made easier. So at Altium, we're meeting the challenge head on. Right now, OnTrack podcast listeners have an exclusive, significant discount on Altium Designer with Altium 365 subscription. And to make this even easier, we're offering extended interest-free payment terms and a $400 bonus if you refer a collaborator so they get this deal too. So click the link below in the show notes to get your discount code now. Well, hi, Jerry. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm eager to have this conversation and pass on your wisdom to our audience. Thank you for having me back. Uh, uh, it's always a pleasure um, being a part of the, you know, the education for the uh, designers in the industry and sharing what we know from manufacturing. Well, um, for context, for those who may have not seen you on the podcast the last couple of times, why don't you give us a brief intro of yourself, your industry background, and then um, tell us about Summit Interconnect Technologies. So Summit Interconnect is the second largest print and circuit board manufacturer in North America. Um, we have uh, multiple facilities that uh, specialize in um, highly complex, high layer count, rigid flex, rigid boards, military signal integrity, and RF. And um, we've got a lot of experience, a lot of capabilities. As far as myself, um, I started off in the industry when I was 20 at, uh, in 1984 at Ever Charles Test Equipment and uh, spent a couple of years there and then started working for Octratech, Orbitech which became the number one cam laser plotter producer in the world. I think they, they, they like to boast that 95% of all boards in the world are built uh, on their systems. And um, I was lucky enough to be a part of that when it started. Um, it was a great training ground for me to work with many different customers during that period of time. And I've been in the manufacturing of printed circuit boards since 1995 and learned a few things along the way. C12. 6018 in a lot of different committees, which has actually helped me to uh, understand where our industry is and where it's going. Great. Thanks for the, for giving us a little insight to your, your background. You and I, our, our years track rather closely. So, uh, Jerry, why don't you just give a brief overview of the, the issue that we saw it was really, at least I noticed it, just kind of starting last year with this this weird via reliability thing that everyone's having. So define for the listeners what exactly you're talking about. So micro vias are a connection, a very small connection, and um, that goes generally from one dielectric to the next dielectric, um, typically formed by laser drilling uh, the copper or pre-etching, and then laser ablating the dielectric stopping on the bottom, which is called a target pad. Um, this allows you to do higher density interconnects uh, through multiple sublamination and using the smaller um, geometries, you're able to get denser designs, smaller components, and um, use less layers because you're, you're routing um, a more dense uh, design. And um, everything was fine. Everything was okay. 
And then we went to stack microvias. And then we started stacking more microvias on top of other ones. And we used to stack microvias. We started doing it back in 2004, 2005 uh, for our semiconductor customers. And we would stack sometimes eight layers deep. Um, and there was no problem because in those that time, they put a socket on there. And that was the connection. And there was no soldering going on on these highly stacked microvias. As people were buying the components from the semiconductor companies, they started building boards and designing with stacked microvias. And usually people just started off with one microvia deep and everything was fine. Then we started doing two microvias and everything was pretty much okay, no, no issues. And then um, we started doing three and four stack and we started to hear stuff that people were having problems. And so the presentation I gave to the Orange County Council was to share with them the problems of multiple stack microvias, more than two. And what we know now and what's going on in the industry and what is safe um, and how to prove that the board that was built is actually going to be able to survive assembly. Because as we found, once you get to the third mi stack microvia and beyond, you're going to have failures randomly. And um, in the presentation, my second slide was a picture of my finger over a, a board. And I go, if you've ever been here and it works if you hold your finger down, and you let go, it stops working. And the, the part of the, the line at the bottom was, it's probably why here for the, you're here today for this presentation. <laughs> I love that slide. Um, before we plow ahead into the deep waters of this conversation, two things. One, explain what a stack micro V is and maybe a little bit of insight to what that looks like to manufacture. Because I think it's one thing to design, another thing to manufacture, and then we'll dig into the problem. And just so our listeners know, the way I found out about it is that IPC formed a council about via reliability, excuse me, not a council, a committee, and everybody was pulling their hair out because there was this intermittent random problem that couldn't easily be nailed down, cross sections weren't detecting it, and all of a sudden it it was this, you know, very prevalent thing across the industry. So that's how I came to know about it. And then I just happened to attend Jerry's talk and my jaw hit the floor. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is so relevant. So that's why I want to have them on. Okay, Jerry, stacked, stacked microvias. What are they? Difference well, between design and fabrication. So we talked about a, a microvia, which is generally laser bladed and goes one layer deep. And as people wanted to do greater connections and more dense uh, BGA components, 0.4 millimeters in particular, they started stacking them on top of each other. Now, if you look at my hair, they're exactly and calibrated to two mils, two thousandths of an inch. A microvia, we used to make them four. And then we started to see that they weren't as reliable. And then we went to six. So it's like three of my hairs wide. That's what we're laser ablating. And then when we're stacking that on top of another one that was formed earlier, and we can register microvias very well from one to two, two to three, extremely well with our laser direct imaging, our targeting systems and methods that we've developed and learned. But there's a problem. There's a mismatch between the glass epoxy expansion and the copper. Once you go to reflow uh, to melt the solder, to put the component to the board, You've gone beyond the TG of the glass and the glass material, the dielectric wants to expand about 200 parts per million. The copper, it's 16. And the higher the Z axis, one microvia seems to be no problem. Two, all of a sudden you have a slug of copper on top of another slug of copper that doesn't want to move. And the glass epoxy from the top of the top microvia to the bottom of the bottom microvia wants to move 200 parts per million. There's a mismatch. And then as you add a third one, this is the point where the mismatch is beyond the ability for the copper to it to stay connected consistently over and over again. And what we also discovered or we're discovering now is the buried mechanical that is nearby two stack microvias and then there's a buried mechanical that continues on. The distance between those two, the laser via and the buried mechanical, the proximity to each other is also possibly a trigger. 
So the mechanically drilled hole next hole. to this stacked, okay. Because that barrel expands and we expect it to. So it's expanding and next to it, there's a laser field that doesn't want to go anywhere and there's glass expanding. And so there's a, a counter levering effect. And we notice that these things are farther away, you don't see any issues. And if you get closer, the triple four stack micro VS will start triggering much more easier in the design. So is there a recommended distance between say a stack micro via and a mechanically drilled hole that you recommend or is there an IPC standard around that? Where do we stand there, today? There is no standard because we're just discovering this. Um, literally next week, two years ago, one of my guys built a coupon wrong where they put the buried mechanical next to three stack laser via six mils away on one net on the same coupon. There's two nets per coupon. He built it 12 mils away. The one at 12 mils passed 100%. And the other one that was six failed four out of the six coupons that were being tested. And I go, what happened here? And I looked inside the structure and I go, there's a trigger. My feeling, and, and I'm collecting data through OM testing. We're using, we have an OM tester at Summit um, to check for reliability after we build the boards um, when it's flow down as a requirement. And what we're doing is we're looking at the distance between the buried mechanical and the laser, stack laser VS in particular, when they're too close, do we see triggers of failures? And if they're far enough away, do we see them passing 100%? It looks like the number, and this is not the edge pad to edge pad. This is the laser diameter and the drill diameter of the berry. It appears to be about 14, edge to edge, not center to center, edge of the laser via to the edge of the buried mechanical. It appears that that distance is 14 and it's safe. It appears, but we're collecting data and we'll continue to do so with our OM testers. So basically you discovered this by accident, is what you're saying. Yeah, my is... whole career is just an accident of being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> well, you know, I, we're all there a little bit, but who knew, right? So no, anyways, for our audience, there you go. Uh, like uh, Jerry, hopefully if you do get the data and you're able to, we'd love to see that. And, and I have shared that data. Oh, you have? Yeah. Oh. Uh, by the way, listeners, I'm going to throw Jerry's slide deck from the talk that I mentioned in the show notes. So you can go through and get a deeper dive where you have visuals, right? Because obviously yeah. on a podcast, we can't, we right. can't give you visuals. Um, so about the, the difference of the expansion rate. So is it possible that you have a perfectly electrically sound board, then leave your fab house and then go to an assembly house and it fail after it goes through reflow? Yes. So we, we've we discovered that over time. Um, in fact, this story goes back to 11 years. So just to let you know, well, maybe someone's not that good at doing stack microviews. The most complicated one I did was a 30 layer in which the micro vias were stacked in every dielectric, 29 stacked micro vias in the 30 layer board. And when they assembled it, it popped because the mismatch between the glass expansion and the copper that's stacked on top of each other just tore itself apart. They studied it, they, they went too deep, staggered, too deep, staggered, and went back and forth for the 30 layers and the boards worked. That goes back 11, nine years. Um, so the IPC has put a warning in IPC 6012 Rev E, which is due, that came out at the end of March, where they warn about checking the reliability of micro you, you need to check them. And uh, so the, we're, we've seen the, the, the failures. We know what diameters work. I had a gentleman tell me nearly 15 years ago we had nothing to do with circuit boards. He was just a physicist who analyzed a failed microvia. And he says, you need to make them six mils in diameter. And I'm going, no, you don't know anything about circuit boards. It takes longer to make a six instead of a four mil laser via. It takes longer to play the six than it does a four. I go, well, I'm not doing that. Almost a decade later, I came across the same thing where somebody told me it's six mils in diameter. I built test coupons a four, a six, and an eight, all in the same panel and tested them. 
six and eights went a thousand test cycles, never failed. The fours would fail between 300 and 400 cycles. So there was something, <laughs> and I was just stubborn and didn't listen, about the size and diameter of microvias. And if you're doing a 0.4, it's hard to put a six mil microvia in it. But if you want a reliable design, they just can't fail. Six mil microvia is kind of the magic number for working right now. We are looking at ways to make microvia stronger. We know that the, the failure is typically between the interface between the, the target pad, the electroplated pad, and the electroless. No one knows why or how to turn on or off the trigger to failure. We know we can test for it through the OM testing. We can validate that the, the, the manufacturing is solid, but the actual trigger when and when it doesn't fail, we don't know how to do that yet. We, we do know certain geometries that work. A six mil diameter or bigger in laser via and an aspect ratio of the micro via, which includes a starting foil on the top, which is called a capture pad, including that thickness, the aspect ratio should be 0.7 to 5 to 1. 70, 0.75 to 1 aspect ratio. You go above that, you start running the risk of the glass expansion, that mismatch of 200 parts per million versus 16, that you could run into trouble. Why I, one, I, you know, I think you're so smart and great. And because I came from the bareboard industry, I've worked with some really, there's only a handful I've known, but you're one of them that does the front end engineering, the board shop. And so you guys see it all. And some have particularly built some of the hardest boards for sure that are built in the United States and probably beyond because you're doing military class two, class three, like crazy stuff. I've, I've been in those shops and I've seen some of the stuff you guys have produced, not to mention RF microwave and all that, which is a whole nother ball of wax. So what I think is really compelling about this conversation, Jerry, is like you're on the front lines of some of the hardest boards, you know, that I think are being produced out there. So I, I'm fortunate enough to work with some of the smartest people and I stand on their shoulders. It's not, they really have allowed me to be a part of the development of the OM tester, the people that were studying and looking at this. Um, I really believe in divine providence that I was really just lucky to be at the right place at the right time. I can't be this lucky this for so many years. And I worked with so many talented, intelligent people and got to learn in those experiences. And I'm grateful. You could be echoing my words. I've used that exact term, divine providence, to end up like, hello, I'm doing a podcast with the smartest people around. So I share that. It's great. Um, so we have design engineers on here. You just gave them some good geometries that aren't published by IPC that will help them be successful. What other kind of advice would you um, impart to designers um, talk to your fabricators about um, the geometries you're trying to use. If you're doing something for the first time, if you're trying to make a smaller drill, if you're trying to um, um, put a lot of complex uh, attributes in one design, you can overload it. Um, you, if you're trying to use the thickest copper in the smallest space and the smallest drill and the highest, any one of these might work, but when they're all combined together, it may not work. And so you should ask the fabricators. We you kind of know where the make and break point is on, uh, on putting things together. And um, a lot of times we get designs where we're going, you really don't want to do this. Well, it's too late and we don't have time for the, the budget. Can't you just build it the way it is? And, uh, and many times, I'll, especially when I go, look, is this a reliability board? Go, yeah, go, no, you don't have to build in it. It's, it's, you're, you're not going to get reliability out of it. Other ones is like, what are you doing? Uh, it's just a bench board. We're just evaluating a semiconductor chip. It actually only runs for like 20 minutes and we're done with it. I go, yeah, we can do that. And it's just riskier. Um, we use four mil mechanical drills at really high aspect ratios, but if a military customer came in, I want to use that. I go, no, you're not going to, no, we're not going to put that in your design. Um, so just ask, um, let them know what kind of environment it goes to, what your end requirement is. We'll get folks that ask us, can you use this geometry, this pad? And there should be follow-up questions. Is this class two or class three? And, or are you epoxy filling that hole? 
and how much copper is in that hole? Because you can, you can take a board that's just a through hole, use a small drill and it's fine. But if you say, I want one and a half mil copper in a hole, I want to epoxy fill it, and this is the aspect ratio, I go, no, you can't have the other two things. You can have this small hole with no fill and, and standard copper thickness, but you can't have a smaller hole because you wanted more copper. And epoxy fill it, which I can't get in the hole because now it's too small for me to fill 60%. So um, talk to the fabricators because we want good yields. We want to build good yields and deliver quantity on time because it costs us a lot of money to start a remake. Material is costly for sure, but the, the labor costs and the process steps is where the, a lot of the money's at. So we don't want to have to start over again because it's just cutting edge or too many attributes that are very complex all tied into one design. So what magnification of a microscope do you use to evaluate uh, the vias? So a, a standard mechanical uh, via is analyzed or, or reviewed at 100x and refereed at 200x. Microvias are evaluated at 200x and are refereed between 400 and 500x. It's, that's, that's the requirement, uh, which is kind of weird because it's two numbers. Um, but when, you, uh, when you're looking at an internal cross-section, there's two conditions you have to check. You have to check what's called as the as-polished condition. So you do 6x reflow. And then you, you make your cross section, you polish it, and you have to evaluate before you do micro etch. And in a mechanical drill, you want to make sure there's no separation between the barrel and the interface pad and make sure everything's good. Because once you micro etch, which is taking a little bit of chemistry and, and micro etching it, you can't, you'll now see the electrolyst line. Now, you're not supposed to see any separation in the as polished condition. It's supposed to be super smooth, almost mirror finish. So if you see a dark line on a mechanical, you know you've got a failure at separation. But when you micro etch it, you can't tell anymore because there's a hard line. It's, you have different um, colors and textures between electroless, electroplated copper, and the electroplated copper that's the foil. In microvias, you have to evaluate in the as polished condition and if there's any separation. And sometimes you cannot see it at 400 or 500 X. You have to go to a much higher magnification, like 3000. And then you kind of see, yeah, there is a crack that goes across here. That's not required in IPC. And that's kind of why in 6012 Rev E, they said, look, you should do a performance test with OM testing to see if your resistance changed because it is very difficult to catch these fine, fine features. Most workshops don't have scopes that go over 500. And with the OM tester, the resistance will change and you will find it. So let's just talk about how it could bite designers, right? by not having some of these things available at their, at their board house, which generally flows through their EMS supplier because they're usually doing turnkey, which is frustrating, but not always. So how can this bite, if they de design it in orderly, they don't have that conversation, what's the fallout once it gets to reflow? What's, what's the implication? You're gonna have intermittent opens, which are the worst. You turn it on and it works fine. 30 minutes, two hours later, it stops working or it's not working right. And it just keeps doing this. Some of the some of the parts, some of the boards are, some of them are not. And then you push down and it starts working again. And you're just like, it's a mystery. Is it a ball? Is there a void in the solder ball? Is there a connection? Was there some contamination on the surface? All these things go through your head. So a little bit of history. We discovered, and as they were developing the own tester, that there was a problem with three stack and more microvias. Six, seven years ago, warning customers not to do it. They just simply said, well, maybe you can't do it. And that's why you're saying it. I go, I have built a 30 layer board stack. And I'm telling you, to stop doing it. You're going to put your program and your designs and your company in jeopardy trying to make this work. And it's difficult to be the lone prophet in the wilderness crying out, stop doing this. And nobody and everybody proceeding down with three and four stack microvias. Over the last two years, they've all, most of them have stopped doing it. And, and, and it's to the point, if we get, if for your four stack microview, I'll get on the phone and explain to them what they're gonna experience, that they should redesign it and why. I'll give them data. And some go, well, we're gonna do it anyway. Fine, go ahead. Because it has to pass DM testing. I'll do D testing, OMD coupon testing. 
for data collection, but I'm not going to re- I'm not going to use it for qualification. Your competitor will let them have it, and then they're usually back a year or two later, staggering their microvias. Ah, uh, it's painful process. So. Tell us a little bit um, about the OM testing and what that allows you to see and hopefully do some preemptive, you know, okay. catches. So the D-coupon is you can generate a D-coupon for free at uh, the website for Conductor Analysis Technology. And you build the same structure that's in your board. So if you have a 12 mil micro via pad for capture and target pad, you use that same size in the coupon. If you're using a six mil laser, you put a six mil laser. If you have a buried mechanical 14 mils away, you tell it build the coupon 14 mils away. You put the same pads or non-functional pads removed. You build the same structure in the coupon like you have on the board. And then you place these coupons around your step. And if you have a four up apart, you put the coupons around it. And it goes through the same manufacturing processes that every stage the board does. And at the end, you cut the coupons out and you um, send Put it in the tester for evaluation. There's a press fit connector, so there's no soldering, so the connector gets press fitted in, and then you put that connector into the tester, and it's got a little chamber. It's only about that, about that high, and you can fit 24 coupons in it. And they're about one and a half inches by uh, 1.75, I think, by 0.55. You can fit 24 in the chamber, and you tell it, "I want 6x reflow at 230, 245, 260, or any number you want." how many reflows you want, and then you can do thermal shock if you want from like minus 55 to 125C. And when that connector goes in, it's on four Kelvin wire, checking to see if the resistance will change more than 5%. If it's over 5%, it's a failure. And you can see the resistance values during the test for the reflow cycles, through the thermal shock cycles, and you can see failures. You can see at reflow, it was against the peak, the thing just goes open, as it cools down, it comes down and reconnects. And you get coupons that have gone open, six reflows. You take the coupon, you put a meter on it, and it's less than one ohm. After it, it, it showed you six times, it went open at reflow temperature. But you're holding this coupon at room temperature because it's completely connected, making you think that it's good, there's nothing wrong. But it did fail, and that's a rejected panel. You don't shift that one. Very interesting. So... Does every board shop have these OM testers now? Like, how prevalent is this this it's, tester? It's new. Um, not every board shop has it. Um, we've had it since October of last year, mm-hmm. and it is. You, it's not that exciting to look like. It's a box with a, op- a lid on top, and you unscrew it. You put the coupons in, you close the lid, and there's a there's a computer next to it. It looks very boring. When customers see that we have it. You would think you're showing them a laser direct imaging or a laser drill machine for the first time. They just are so excited that this reliability test is in house. It's 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 a very good marketing tool. Well, nothing's more maddening than an intermittent problem so, that you you you're just you're making wild guesses, right? And it's it's maddening. So, um, Jerry, we are getting ready. I think in May, we're going to be um, unleashing on the world uh, through something called Altium Academy. It's going to be an education site that will have non-tool specific and Altium designer specific training on it. I would love to have you come do a master track on this and show your slides if you'd be willing to do that. You up for that? Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, Okay. All right, we'd love for you to do that because I just think if we share this information, you know, hopefully we'll save a few a few lumps on the hit. So, so yeah, that, that was the whole purpose of the presentation was to help the industry know what they could use to understand if they had good quality product that they could put their components on without risk. Well, we're always pushing the envelope, so yeah, you know. Yeah whatever we can do to, to, to get the word out there. So Jerry, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for the great insight that you shared with um, people who are listeners who listen to the podcast. And I'm sure, buddy, I'll be knocking on your door again for another subject soon. <laughs> and thank you for allowing Summit to share our capabilities uh, with the industry and how we're here to help. 
My pleasure. To our audience, thanks so much for joining me today in this conversation with Jerry Partita of Summit Interconnect Technologies. Please remember to like, subscribe, and send us your comments. We'd love to hear from you and what kind of information you like learning about on the podcast. Excuse me. We will see you next time. Until then, remember to always stay healthy, stay safe, and stay on track. Take care.